I said to myself, David, what were the two most dominant forces in the last 20 years in American culture, 1960, 1980? And the answer was, television and rock and roll. So how can MTV not work, right? So, and obviously it blew up and it was a great ride. Our group is a lot different from probably most musicians and colleges and things around the world because we actually have a purpose and we want to create a better world through our music and a better industry. So I was really happy to meet David, which I'll give you a little backstory. All of you know, I told you about a group that I'm working with called the One Degree Network, which is a really cool amassing of unique individuals from all different platforms, walks of life, um, different business owners, entrepreneurs, and people who truly have a a mission and a conscious uh, outlook and insight about the world around us and what's going on. So in the last couple of meetings that I've had the pleasure of being joined with everyone on these, uh, these pl- in this uh, group, we've had some really insightful discussions. And one of them is a project that David's working on called the Fork in the Road Project. Now, what makes David really interesting and I think great for our group is because he's worked in media for at one point for like 20 years working with CNN, uh, MTV, Nickelodeon, and was part of the executive team of some of these things. And he's won Emmys. So he is someone who's on our side in the sense where he understands where we look at the media and how we're a part of it, but also he's a futurist and he's a, he's a forward thinker. And all of you who've been around me for long enough know that I have those same ambitions. That's part of the way I think. So when David and I were kind of put together in a group, there was just a lot of uh, great energy and a great uh, forward thinking of how can we help this planet move forward. And I think that artists and musicians and influencers have some of the most pivotal positions in the planet we've ever had before. Because back in history, you had to be a king or queen or someone of major importance to make major change. Now you can be someone from home with a microphone and some a good camera. And if you have the right intention, if you're the right voice, if you're creating the right platform, you can influence millions. And I think because we're in this unique position in, in the world and history, the people in our group who are musicians who are taking their careers seriously and taking their art seriously have some of the biggest chance to impact the future generations that's ever been around in history. That being said, how you doing, David? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So, you know, so I'm a futurist, right? And, and the way I became a futurist is um, living a life ahead of the curve. And I don't know why that is. I was always interested in what was going on in the world. And I always did things in my life, and, and this is one of the messages I want to I want you to hear. I always did things that resonated with me. You know, so I graduated from from college with an art history degree, and I was a hippie, and I'd done lots of psychedelics. And you know, all I wanted to do, and this is like 1970, was work, buy a van, and live in a van. And at that time, people weren't doing it, so that was really the dumbest thing. And I went ahead and did it, and. I remember that to this day, a year in the van. You know, fast forward to 1980, and I was like the number one sales guy at CBS, the network, which was then, you know, the top of three networks. And I took a 50% pay cut to go join the, at the time, probably 25 people who we then launched, created and launched MTV, and then Nickelodeon, VH1, CNN, CNN News. And so in 1980, when I got this call and I'm thinking, you know, I was a young stud salesman, I was thinking, God, why would I take a 50% pay cut? I said to myself, David, what were the two most dominant forces in the last 20 years in American culture, 1960, 1980? And the answer was, television and rock and roll. So how could MTV not work, right? So, and obviously it blew up and it was a great ride, but you got to think outside the box and you got to think in terms of trends. And so that, then fast forward to the late nineties when I was um, uh, operating at dot-com 1.0 out in LA and uh, we were the first people who ever created online courses. Oh, that'll never work, right? So it wasn't until this century where I had a, I had a, and I'm sure some of you have had what I'm about to describe. I had a transformative experience. A friend of mine invited me to speak to uh, a conference in Berkeley, and it was December 2004. In that moment, for 45 minutes, I was, I was totally calm. I was totally present. I was totally aware. I was, I was totally meditative state, and yet I was controlling this whole room. So I witnessed myself, and I said, what is, it that, what is this sensation? Because I want to stand in this sensation again. I mean, it's, it's maybe like, you know, you're performing and you're just at one, right? And so I was in the zone. 
And the witnessing was, I was being a catalyst to get people to think about the future and then to facilitate a conversation about it, which is what I hope to have tonight with you. And to this day, that's how I describe being a futurist. So that brings me to what will be a, a short presentation, just to give you the, the context of the way I think all of you should think about the future. Um, but this book is the first of uh, this. This came. This, this is based on this book, the most disruptive decade in history, book one. This is really a significant time. You are stepping into the most transformative time in history. Uh, realities we know will change. Whenever I have a C-19, it's obviously COVID-19. I always have to say, I want you to suspend what you think reality is because you won't be able to see the future if you go, well, yeah, but that doesn't jive with what I think, right? And so what COVID-19 has done is it's disrupted everybody's lives. So instead of me having to say that, people are saying to me, so what's, what's going to happen, right? So they already know. So in other words, the reality that every one of you is living in January of 2020 wasn't the reality you spent the rest of your year. So the point to be made is reality is transitory. It's not fixed. In some ways, so, socially, it's a collective hallucination. We all agree that we're going to do this together. So that it's this collective lack of reality that becomes a reality. So realities we know are going to change when the old gives way to the new. Creative destruction, it's a historical term. You know, horse and buggy gets creatively destroyed by the automobile. Across the board disruption. You know, again, COVID-19, uh, entertainment's been disrupted transportation's been disrupted, um, conferences. So it's a time where everything is gonna get accelerated. But say five years worth of change has been collapsed into a year, which is the opportunity. Change brings opportunity. Don't ever think this, don't ever say this. When will things come back or coming back to normal? You know, the, the metaphor that's being used about COVID is the, oh, we're approaching the light at the end of the tunnel, we're getting vaccinated. The, light, the daylight that we're going to merge into is not the daylight that we left when we entered the tunnel. So it's not like things are going to come back. First of all, there's no such thing as normal anyway. So, so you know, I'd say this mainly to older people. The younger you are, the more you get this. So major dynamics. These are the four. Almost all the changes are going to fall under these four. First of all, it's the age of intelligence. What this means is not just artificial intelligence, which I call technological intelligence, but it's the final mapping of the brain, okay? Now, all my life, and you know, I'm, I'm twice as old as probably everybody here at least, um, I've been, it's been said, we've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years than all the time before. Now we're gonna close the loop. So we're gonna learn about the brain, which means transformative medical ways of treating disease. It's gonna be, it's gonna unleash a whole new amount of quantum computing and parallel computing. And so, and it's the time, as I'll talk about, where things become intelligent. Um, and so there's that. And there's, there's that all the issues, the moral issues around that is what do we want? Do we want robotic overlords, whatever that is? 50% of the people are going to lose their jobs, things like that. The age of climate, and this is where I go really deep. Um, I've written two books on climate change. I set up a global nonprofit called this spaceshipearth.org to create crew consciousness. As Marshall McLuhan said around the first Earth Day in 1970, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We are all crew. So my mission has been to get people to think as crew members. You want to be an astronaut? You are, right? But more than that, it, it, the second book I wrote came out in 2019, basically is the argument for reinventing capitalism to face climate change. And, and change everything about it. And, and all the research I did says if we, humanity, whenever I use the pronoun we, I'm talking about humanity, when we, humanity, if we don't make the changes that need to be made by 2030, there will not be civilization, as you know, by 2100, without question, right? So there's that. Then there's the emerging new consciousness. And with this group, I'm gonna go into that a little bit more than they usually do with corporate types. So I really believe that, that that the internet today is this kind of pulsing synaptic technological model of a new consciousness. And that's where music comes to play, obviously. And then the reinvention of capitalism and democracy, because capitalism was invented in uh, the 1700s, as was democracy. And both of them need to be updated to the 21st century. I mean, when Adam Smith, who is the, who is the intellectual 
uh, forefather of capitalism wrote the book, he was in the agricultural age, so he never even saw the industrial age. So all these things need to be redone. So I'll put these three up that are underpinning all the change all of you have felt in your life. First of all, the flow to global. Obviously the global economy, but we use the word global. It's constructed in their mind. 20 years ago, we said overseas, foreign, international. Now it's global, right? So we're organizing around all of us. At the same time, there's the flow to the individual. So as, as Adam referred to, we're more powerful as individuals. You as musicians have a technological platform that the Beatles didn't have. And the Beatles got it, but there were 5,000 other bands that didn't because they didn't have the access. So, so there's the flow to the individual. And that came about because of the explosion of choice. The explosion of choice means the power goes from the producer to the consumer, from the institution to the individual. And then both of these are amplified by the single greatest force in the planet was the accelerating electronic connectedness. So this is the underpinning of the on-demand economy. This is the underpinning of what of you, the freedom of your access. This is the ability for purpose to win the day because the hierarchies have been blown up. Shift age is the shift between reality as we knew it historically up to the year 2000 and the reality that we're gonna to start to be living in the 2030s. So literally it's a tire shift of reality. And so back in 2010, I was saying, and this blew up on the internet. I mean, I remember it was a Friday and I was down here in Florida writing my second book and it was just like, this is what the definition means. So in 2010, I was saying that the CEOs, Madam CEO, Mr. CEO, if you're not in the business of changing the nature, shape, character, form of your business, you might not have one in 10 years, right? So then this was the decade of the collapse of legacy thinking. Legacy thinking is thought from the past. Thought creates reality. So the thinking of the past creates the reality of today. So we're always living in this legacy thinking. Most of us had powered into the 21st century with 20th century constructs. So what this decade was, it's the first decade of 21st century thought. Like for example, um, if, if we matriculate climate change, um, future historians are gonna look back and go, this is when they started thinking. This is the name of the second book. The 2020 is a decade of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is what you've experienced with COVID where you're sitting at the home, you know, but everything else is different. So you have to manage two realities and you're confused by it, right? So the 2020s is the time where change dramatically speeds up, disruption, creative disruption, and the time when the current and past reality gives way to the new. So, you know, in the music profession, say, or the music movement, however you want to categorize yourself, you have to deal with the old reality. But the reason that I so resonated with, with Adam's invitation to speak to you guys is because you're, you're, gonna, you're creating a new reality, right? You're, you're purpose-driven, you're collective. You really have to lean into the new part more than the old part. And you're gonna be constantly fighting it. You're gonna find the end around and how to do it. And that's why collectively you'll succeed. You know, whereas individually you might get chopped up. So um, this is what has always been thought of as Darwin, survival of the fittest, survival of the strongest. That's not true. And COVID has shown, and this decade will prove the survival of the adaptive, survival of the resilient. If you're not adaptive and you can't be resilient, then just, you know, go off grid forever, right? I mean, in other words, you really have no choice but to be adaptive and resilient faster and faster and faster. So now these are four quotes that are at the front of this book uh, the, the, of which this is a part. In the revelation of any truth, there are three stages. In the first, it is ridiculed. In the second, it is resisted. And then the third is considered self-evident. Climate change is a hoax. So remember this, this is profound. And you have to hold this in your mind. I always had to hold up my mind because gee, am I doing the wrong thing? My instinct tells me, my gut tells me, everything is pulling me this way. Okay, Schopenhauer, stay focused, David, right? This is the best quote about the future I have ever seen. I've managed to get in every single one of my books. We should try to be the parents of our future rather than the offspring of our past. I'm assuming I'm speaking to the parents of the future of the music industry or music business, right? 
And, and I mean, that's the vibe I was getting. That's right, right? I, I mean, you're nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. I mean, that's what you're doing. You are the, you know, you're young, you probably don't have kids, but in a sense, you're parenting the future of the music industry. And, and I love when he said purpose, because that's what this decade is all about. Now, this is a great quote. And he said, the illiterate of the 21st century would not be those that cannot read and write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So in the context of education, it's lifelong learning, right? I mean, you can't graduate from college and, oh, I'm educated for life. Not only have we left the industrial age, we left the knowledge economy, we're in the learning economy, right? So you got to always be learning. So if you're not in a state of constant learning, constant inquiring, constant curio intellectual curiosity, you're gonna fall behind. But what I say to leaders, and, I, and I'm assuming this might apply to some of you, this unlearn becomes a dominant verb in your life. What did you learn in high school? What did you learn from the music teacher? I'm making this up, that you're gonna to have to unlearn to do what you wanna do. How are you going to have to unlearn what you've been taught to learn something new, right? So think of that, unlearning. Am I unlearning the stuff that's held me back? Am I unlearning what my parents told me? Am I unlearning the whatever that is, okay? That's really important. And then finally, um, and this is a quote, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan, okay? I'm not very good at martial arts, but I'm a Bruce Lee fan. And so what happened last March for me was COVID blew up my business model. 90% of my revenue went away because I drive to the airport, go through an airport, get on a plane, maybe get on another plane, get picked up or Uber, um, meet people, speak to hundreds of thousands of people, interact with them and go back. So it was gone. So I had to struggle, you know, and, and I was an age, well, do I want to keep doing it? And I said, yeah, I do. And I read this quote at the right time. So don't get into one form, adapt it and build your own and be like water. Empty your mind, be formless and shapeless. You put water in a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Be water, my friend. So what I did is I put myself in the vessel called COVID. How does a futurist who brings value, who serves his highest purpose, who tries to give his highest purpose to the planet, how do I deal with this? So now you see I'm in, a, I'm in a semi green screen studio and I'm building another one. So instead of getting on, a, getting on two to three planes in 20 hours of travel to go to Shanghai to give a talk or to Australia, I can give a talk in Shanghai and Australia on the same day and not leave home, right? So, so, so this, every single day since COVID, be like water, David. I hope that's a metaphor that works for some of you. So. I'm going to put this up because I think I'm talking to a majority of people who are under the age of 40, perhaps. Um, I wrote a book in 2012 called Entering the Shift Age. And these were the arbitrary birth years for these two generations. Um, I think most of you probably fit into these. Um, interesting thing is each of these is now bigger than the baby boom. Each of these is now bigger than the baby boom ever was. And both of these generations together are in the majority as of 2021. So more people under the age of 40 are alive in the United States than older the age of 40. Um, the boomers and the Gen Xs were the last people to grow up in the sense of place. Um, the example I use is, so now I'm in Sarasota, Florida, and my, my aunts and uncles used to live down here when I was a little boy in Chicago. So what that meant was, oh, 1,500 miles away every other year, we'll visit the family. And then on my birthday and Christmas, I'll get a call, a landline, and I'll get a check in the mail, right? Now, if you're down here in your retirement, oh, my grandchild's on, on the phone. And, you know, the grandchild's going, hi, grandma. So the five-year-old doesn't think of place. They think of space because we're connected with the accelerated electronic connectedness. So everything is moving to a spatial context rather than place-based. 1900 Fifth Avenue, Easter Sunday, spot the automobile. There's one, right? 13 years later, spot the horse. There's none. So the point, I, two points I'm making. One is what I'm about, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you and have been saying to you, you know, that's going to happen by the end of 2030, 
you have to believe because speed of change is maybe 100th the speed it is today, more than 100 years ago, and this happened. So real quickly, I'm just going to go through these because you're a technology driven uh, uh, medium now. All of these things are going to happen. Nanotechnology, billionth of a meter, bots going in the body, medical, um, brain computer interface. This starts to set up the new consciousness. We've gone from typing to computers to touchscreen to voice. Now you can put on something on your head, use your brain waves, and direct your brain waves to the computer to take action. Like I, if this was that, if I was set up that way, I'd say next bullet point would come up, right? So this is gonna be mainstream by the middle part of the decade. And what that means is by the end of the decade, there's gonna be hundreds of millions of people in the world who have developed the ability to project thought onto computers. Does it not make sense that we can elevate that and to do it to one another? I mean, I would argue yes. Augmented reality, virtual reality. Music is gonna be huge in this, right? The three senses that trigger memory are are sight, smell, and sound. I grew up in Chicago. I smell cut grass, I think summer. I hear blockchain, um, I think it's gonna be important for your industry, uh, but I'm jumping into it because it may be uh, the new currency or may not be. And implantable chips, right? There's a quarter million people in the United States right now that have a chip implanted in their brain because it's implanted in the part of the brain that triggers uh, Parkinson's. So if you ever met Parkinson's in their, in their hand shaking, they can press a button that now you can do it on a, on a smartphone and the shaking stops. By 2023, now that we're mapping the whole brain, remember, memory is multiple parts of the brain. So what that means is now we're coming into it where by 2023, it's been estimated, we're going to have implantable memory chips. So think technological solution to Alzheimer's. I mean, the joke among futurists is you can get the short term memory chip or the long term memory chip, right? So, so, but that's coming. It's going to transform healthcare, right? I mean, so, you know, we all know about the mind body balance, right? I mean, Western medicine thinks the connection between mind and body is the neck, right? But, but so we're going to, we're going to be integrating our whole body through health, through treatment, through the brain. Additive printing. 3D printing, I don't need to go into that, but I can talk about it. So here's something that's important. Right now we talk about smartphones, smart doorbells, smart thermostats, right? So we're moving from dumb to smart. We're gonna start move to smart to intelligent, okay? So in the next five years, you're gonna walk into rooms that are intelligent. They'll know you're there. There's something called um, externalization of the mind. And that's what this is, right? It's a cell phone, it's a smartphone. I don't, my son is 34, he lives in Amsterdam, been living there for five years. I don't know his phone number, I just press Christopher, right? So we've externalized our minds. Like those of you that make lists, right? You've externalized your mind, you, particularly when you make it night, so you external, what do I need to do tomorrow so you can forget about it and go to sleep, right? We're gonna be able to externalize our thoughts into our environments before the end of this decade. So, and then the next step is everywhere intelligence is going to open the door to everywhere consciousness. We're going to have environments probably by the early 30s, 2030s, they're going to conscious. They have a conscious awareness of how many people are in the room and what's going on and, and whether it's too hot or too cold. I mean, it's an awareness that is now live with environments. I'm just gonna go through this because I wanna to get to the other. All of these things are gonna happen. Technological intelligence, massive disruption, generational shift, energy and transportation are each 20% of the global GDP and they're obviously gonna be disrupted intensely. So 40% of the global GDP is gonna be highly disrupted. And I don't know about this, but we're all living on too much debt and no one's given me the answers to how we're gonna resolve that. But I think sometime around the mid decade, there's gonna be some kind of debt implosion that's gonna you know, rock the financial world. Um, we're even going to have to define life. We have the capability of cloning humans now. We have the capability and are doing it in laboratories. So a man and a woman, age 25, want to have kids. She's got, uh, she's got dominant trait uh, Parkinson's. So what they do is they take her egg and they take the sperm and they freeze them both. And then they go in while the egg is frozen and they take out the DNA of, of Parkinson's and then they raise the temperature up in vitro, she carries it to term, and never will there be Parkinson's in the offsprings of those kids. We can do that now. So we're gonna have issues, moral issues, 
healthcare and medicine are going to bring us some moral issues that, that we haven't had to deal with. So it is all of this, it's an incredible time to be alive. Um, that's really the, the le if you will, the left right brain part of it. So this is where it resonated with Adam. And this is where I am asking you as creatives who have purpose, who have a collective purpose to think about changing the world, okay? So um, you all understand the metaphor fork in the road. One of those three futurists, our Buckminster Fuller, um, wrote in 1969 a book. He wrote two books, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, that we're all going to have to crew, and of course we didn't 50 years later. And oblivion, you know, Utopia or Oblivion, the Future of Humanity. And he said in that book, that in several decades, meaning now, I think, humanity will approach, approach a fork in the road, Utopia or Oblivion. And it is at that fork in the roads that we're going to determine whether we're going to exist in the cosmos or become irrelevant and become extinct. So last fall, I was getting together on Zoom with two futurists who I most highly respect. You're probably most of the futurists I know. One lives in Zurich and the other's in Seattle. And we we're just kind of talking about COVID and what we thought and when would you know in-person conferences come back. And we started talking and all of a sudden, all of us of course have read Fuller and we came up with this metaphor. So within about three Zoom calls, we came up with this concept, the fork in the road project. We want to create a meme, hashtag fork in the road project, that gets amplified creatively, that reaches into the mind of the collective awareness consciousness of humanity as widely as we can spread it and as high as we can go, that yeah, there's the UN and climate change and there's singularity university and technology and, and the, the, the B team trying to change the world and, and Millennium Project, but it's not happening fast enough. So fork in the road is the statement that you'll see here that is there needs to be messaging that we have time to create the good future, to create the future we want, to go down the path, the road that we want to collectively have, as opposed to the road that society and nation states and religion have us on, it's all going down to Armageddon. So we want this, and this is where I think it resonated with you, Adam, right? To some degree. And he said, what about music? And I said, I'm all in. So um, let me... Um, Oh, this one operates differently, hold on. So the fork in the road project, the sea's coming in, it's coming in ever higher. We have this beautiful time right now. COVID is a great opportunity because we're at a pivot point. So the pandemic creates a very unique opportunity for deep paradigm changes. Remember what I said, people are not saying to me, oh, uh, well, reality is they're saying, David, what's the reality gonna look like? So. It, is, it has opened up human consciousness to understand that things are changing. And it is this moment of birth where we can step in and go, it's going to go this way. And we're going to be as right as anybody else. And because we're three futurists who have global reputations, we're being listened to. So the, the hope here is that some of this will be a catalyst for you. So COVID-19 has catalyzed a tidal wave of historic pivot points. Healthcare, biotechnology, no question. Climate change, decarbonization, no question. S sustainable investing. People are moving vast sums of money away from fossil fuels into sustainable investing. I mean, I mean, the richest man in the world is Elon Musk. Why? Because the electric car and the electric roofs and, and everything electric, right? Technology, technology X, you know, multiplied. Inequality, wealth, wealth inequality is greater than it's been any time in history. And whenever it has been this way in history, there's either been revolution or populist uprising, right? New leaders, right? They, you know, I have her email. She heard me talk in 2011 in New Zealand. The prime minister of New Zealand is 38. The three dominant politicians in Finland are 30 something women, right? It is the women leaders of today who've navigated COVID better than any male led democracy, okay? And they're young. They're like yourself. They're your age. 
um, stimulus, the solidarity that's come with the stimulus package, generational change, um, and geopolitics and everything else is changing in the new capitalism, which is one of the things we talk about. This is the quote that we have in our Fork in the Road manifesto at forkintheroad.com. I'd love for you to read it. And if you believe in it, sign it. Um, but this is, this is the quote. Humanity is the final exam whether or not it qualifies or not for existence. We're at that existential level. So the Fork in the Road project is an open, public, global, non-commercial, non-partisan initiative launched by leading futurist thinkers, scientists, leaders, writers, authors, writers, and creatives. We have a couple of prominent sci-fi writers who've won Hugo and Nebula Awards on it. We've got some great authors and, re and philosophers who are involved in this. And we even, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to Burning Man twice. I've spoken there both times as a futurist and as a spiritual, psychedelic oriented futurist. And we're gonna, we're joking, you know, burning fork, but we're probably gonna have this in January of next year. And of course we'll need music. Words speak for themselves. We tell stories about or from the future. Think about writing a song about the road that we ended up taking. You're writing it from the viewpoint of 2035 or something. I mean, I, I've done a lot of writing that way as a futurist. I've said, okay, looking back on the 2020s from 2042, wasn't it great that we right, create and curate media, films, content? I should have put music in there, but I just got this PowerPoint today from him for this. Um, so this is what we want to do. So that this becomes a question by the end of this year. Are you a signatory to the Fork in the Road Manifesto? What are you doing? to accelerate the need to move to the good future. This is the manifesto, you can't read it here, but, but it is here and it is, it, it, it's, it's at forkintheroadproject.com. This is a great quote, right? Again, Fuller, we're staying with Fuller. You can never change things by fighting the existing reality, fighting legacy thinking to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. What are you guys doing in the music industry, right? You're creating a purpose-driven model. These are the four core topics that we put into the manifesto. In other words, we have to get in front of these. If we don't get in front of climate change by 2030, it's gonna be disaster after disaster and you're young and you're gonna be spending the rest of your life living in it. Human use, humane use of technology. We don't want to get ahead of us. We want to understand. I personally think that the next stage of human evolution is the merge of humanity and, and technological intelligence. Sustainable economics, it's not sustainable. What COVID has done in the United States, at least, it's taken the lower middle class and making the working poor, right? And, 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 and this is not right. Human enhancement, singularity, transhumanism, genome editing. We want to be ahead of this. We want to understand how this can be a benefit, not out of some, you know, dystopian sci-fi movie. It's a maze now. We want to make it clear. It's a maze. Where do we go? You listen to mainstream media and it's all about politics and gridlock and stupid and old antiquated. Talk about legacy thinking. Senate rules are legacy thinking. Okay. So, so green is the new digital. Sustainability would be a new profit. We can go this way or we can go that way. And so we come out of the maze and see the, the, the various forks in the road. So there's a power now in the streets. And, and to me, that it harkens back to the 60s. And the 60s was led by musicians, you know, Woodstock. Also, I just want to note this, everyone. I, I know there's, there's a, always the, the thought of, am I stepping too far outside of what the norm is when I'm creating something that hasn't been done before that I've seen, even though I know the people that I looked up to were doing exactly that. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, sense to me. So here's the best thing I can say to someone is um, when you're thinking about what you're doing musically, especially after today's talk, look at yourself and then say, Am I my own role model? Okay. In that moment, if you go, uh, I don't know, what would you, what would that look like? Whatever that distance is and try to create that distance to come closer. 
because what's happening a lot in society right now, and especially when David's talking about the 60s and like my mom used to play all this music and I used to listen to her sing growing up, is there were people who were creating the change that they wanted to see through their voices, through their music, through their energy. And that created um, a community. And that was before the internet. That was before they can put something out and have it go viral. So just realize that same power exists. Nothing's changed in the power system. It's just how we perceive versus attention and compensation or what we really want to say. And those are all just different things. So I, I know right now, for me, I'm thinking of different ideas and we'll all internally talk about this and create some sort of contest so we can be behind this and we'll do some marketing. And those are all the practical things that we're going to do. But I think that part about looking at yourself and going, what do I want to leave? What would I want to leave to a kid of mine? What do I want to leave? What kind of idea system? What kind of reality do I want to create? And if that just gets moving in your body a bit, it's going to move into your mind a bit. It's going to come to the vibrations in your voice a bit. It's going to come through the lyrics you write. It's going to come through the chords you choose. It's going to come in the energy that you'll start to create. Um, so even if there aren't like a bunch of questions, I know it's because everyone's processing. This is the first time we've had someone like David come into the group and talk. So David's like, you got any questions? Everyone's just like, <laughs> the world's about to change, you know? So it's, <laughs> it's a lot. But at the same time, I think internally, we've already kind of known some of these things in different pieces, but we haven't seen them strung out like how he's showing it to us, which makes it a real moment set in, you know? Um, and I think what we're going to do with this also, you know, David, is we're going to piece this together and not only put it in our internal group, but we should put this uh, into all of everyone on our, our newsletter. So Denise, that way we can, we can pivotally show some of the things he's talking about. So other musicians who not, might not be in our private organization, but definitely on the, the Instagram and the YouTubes and, and the newsletters can all start to open that door mentally. Because if we can be the nucleus of the change and this information can be the nucleus of this change that we'll help to create in the future, our kids' kids are going to thank us even if they don't know it. And I think that's really important just to voice real quick. I, I want to say something. Words have meaning. So when I gave this talk a couple of years ago, I started getting the feedback, my God, you're so apocalyptic. And I took offense with that because I'm so optimistic, right? I believe, I mean, I wouldn't be doing this, right? So I looked up the word apocalyptic and it comes from the Greek apocalypsis. And so if you ask somebody what apocalyptic means, it means the end of the world, right? It's the apocalypse. Apocalypsis from the Greek means the lifting of the veil or the reveal or the revelation. So we're entering into an apocalyptic time where the reveal, the veil is going to be lifted into the true reality. And maybe that's a way to think about the music because it is the music that lifts the veil. It, it did in my generation more than anything else. So, so everything, just go back to if you were writing a song in the fall of 2019 versus now, how much has the world changed? Reality is different. I'll stop because you said it better than I did, Adam. So I want to thank everybody. And, and, you know, Adam, thank you for bringing me into your home here. Um, and thank you for all listening, you know, to this, who's this old guy, you know, and he's not a musician. And, and I really appreciate it because to say Adam's words into myself back at you, you know, I want my son to look back and go say, you know, my dad was one of the initiators to fork. Really? Wow, he helped change the world. That's my realm. Beautiful. May you write the songs. <laughs> <laughs>